Well, welcome, and uh, thank you for uh, making it through the rain tonight. I'd like to ask Lou Waters to come up uh, briefly and uh, lead us in the flag salute. Well, thank you and welcome. Uh, thank all of you for coming out for this, this event. It's an exciting time for us to be able to advance our mission through education. My name is Scott Roberts. I'm the Citizen Action Network Director with the Freedom Foundation. And I have a few introductions that I'd like to make. Uh, our CEO, Jonathan Bechtel, is here from the Freedom Foundation. And we have a number of staff. If, if you're a Freedom Foundation staff, would you stand up and uh, be recognized as well? And I would like to thank the Fort Vancouver uh, High School for the facility and for the people that, that are helping us here tonight. I'd also like to thank um, very graciously the uh for your support and partnering and hosting this, this event. And also thank all the press that's here to help us cover this event. There's a couple of elected officials in the audience that I would like to recognize. Representative Paul Harris. I saw walking around somewhere, right there, yes, thank you very much, so. <laughs> and Clark County Auditor uh, Greg, uh, Greg Kinsey, Kimsey, yeah. And I am obligated uh, to say this one thing, and we take this as serious as the IRS does. We're a nonprofit, 501c3. Uh, we are all about education. We do not, and we have not, will not, nor will we ever endorse a candidate. We have a mission and we try to uh, advance that mission through education. We believe that government, our government is best served when the electorate and the citizens of Washington are educated uh, in, and engaged and equipped to make the right decisions. Tonight we hope to uh, learn a little bit along with you about uh, the position of Secretary of State and about uh, the candidates that are, that are running for that position. With that, I'd like to bring up Trent England, who's the Vice President of Policy with the Freedom Foundation, and make a few remarks. Thanks, Scott. Uh, <clears throat> thank you again for, uh, for coming and, and the COUV and, and the other press for covering this. Uh, you know, we, we know today that, that on the one hand, there's no shortage of political news, whether, you know, it, it's Fox News or CNN or MSNBC. Uh, we get bombarded with information and in 2012 I know some people are are looking forward to the fall with with trepidation right that uh, your, your mailbox is going to fill up and uh, and the, the voices are going to get louder and louder and louder and uh, of course all that provides a lot of information but at the same time it also can drown out some very important information and at the Freedom Foundation we really recognize and believe that a lot of the races that don't draw all that attention are very important. And we, we tend to believe, and this may, may well be a, a topic this evening, that one of the reasons why many people either don't vote or stop voting at some point down their ballot is, is not really because people don't care, it's because people feel at some point that they don't have the information that they need. Right? We, we all will be bombarded with information about presidential candidates and senatorial candidates and congressional candidates and gubernatorial candidates. Uh, but down at the level of Secretary of State and uh, legislative races and county races, oftentimes those offices impact people's lives even more and, and much more directly than the, the, you know, all, of the, all of the other things that, uh, that, that gain so much of our attention through the national media. And the Secretary of State, of State we believe, is, is like that, right? Uh, you know, Secretary of State, I mean, what does that, does that mean? You know, does, are, we, are we going to ask them how many words per minute they can type? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, honestly, there are a lot of people in our state who, who don't know anything about what this office is all about. And, of course, the Secretary of State, uh, you know, we, we hope that they have good Microsoft Office skills and, and all that. But, but the Office of Secretary of State is very important for businesses in our state. It's very important for our state archives. 
uh, which matter a lot to, uh, to, to we the people of Washington State um, and very important for our election processes. And I know we're going to hear a discussion tonight that not only will help us learn about the candidates, but really will help us learn about the Office of Secretary of State through the discussion we're going to have, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, it's a huge task to run for an office like, like this, and I think we should recognize that. Uh, it's, it's particularly difficult to run for an office that, at, on the one hand, flies beneath the radar, and on the other hand, is statewide, right? I mean, our, our candidates here, the other candidates in, in this race, will travel the state, and uh, we at the Freedom Foundation are actually in the process of, of doing our own miniature two-week statewide campaign, touring around the state, talking to people, and, and we've been to Clarkston and, and uh, uh, Forks and Colville and Spokane and Nacelle, if, if you know where that is. And uh, it was a little picture of what they're in for, right? And, uh, you know, and, and these are candidates who are raising money to pay for gas. <laughs> you know? and, and, you know, with gas prices what they are, they're going to have to raise more money than they thought. So, uh, so we're, we're glad to, to host them. We're glad to have you here, to have people watching uh, on, the, on the video, uh, because as our state constitution says, at the end of the day, and I'll, I'll read it to you, this is the beginning of our state constitution, all political power is inherent in the people, and governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed and are established to protect and maintain individual rights. But that only happens if we, the people, vote and vote in an informed way. And that's why the Freedom Foundation has gathered you here. That's why we've invited all the candidates to participate tonight, because this is how we, the people of Washington State, uh, maintain that political power with us. And, uh, and we have a, a, an opportunity this November, as we do every November and every four years in the case of these statewide offices, to make our voice heard. And this is, I think, part of the, the beginning of that process. So thank you again. I'm going to pass it back to Scott Roberts. I look forward to, a, I think, a fascinating debate, and I thank the candidates for, for not only being here, but being willing to run and have this conversation this year. So thank you. Well, thank you, Trent. Uh, he is off to the rest of the post-session tour as we speak. So I want to let you know that we have done everything we can uh, to get all of the candidates here tonight. Uh, and we have two of the candidates that have, that have made it. The format tonight has been agreed on uh, by, the candidate, by the candidates. And we're, we have pre-formatted 12 questions. They're going to get randomly asked six of those questions. There was no surprises in those questions. We're going to give the audience a chance to ask questions. We'll pass note cards out, and you can pass them forward, and we'll pick four of those questions. We have a few yes-no questions, and we have introductions and wrap-ups. It's pretty simple. We have timekeepers down here, and I want to introduce to you Victoria Taft, talk show radio host from Cape Ham. You know, many of you know her. She's going to moderate the debate, and our two candidates, which will have a chance for self-introduction, is to my nearest uh, um, Thurston County Auditor Kim Wyman, and Senator Jim Castama. And with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Victoria Taft, and we'll get going on the debate. So thank you very much. Good day to both of you. We have decided that um, after a coin toss, won by Mr. Castama, that uh, Ms. Wyman will take the first question. And uh, we will have you answer the first question, and then Mr. Castama has his uh, chance to uh, also answer the question, then we'll have a rebuttal period for you. We've got a question. Um, I was under the understanding we're going to have some opening remarks. That's absolutely correct. Thank you very much. Okay. You are going to have some opening <laughs> remarks. You'll forgive me. Uh, you're absolutely right. And in so doing, since you did win the coin toss, Mr. Castama, would you like to go first? Certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, I do want to thank Scott. I want to thank Trent for that introduction. I also want to thank the Freedom Foundation. And I want to thank Kim for being here today. I look in the audience, and there are a lot of very familiar faces that I've seen over the years. By the way, I'm Jim Castama, State Senator Jim Castama. I have been a senator now for 12 years. Prior to that, I was a representative for four, so I've been a legislator now for 16 years. Now, those of you who have had interaction with me, you know a lot about my background, but for those of you who haven't, let me just give you a very brief introduction. 
I grew up in the very small town of Puyallup in the 1960s. At that time, it was a farming community surrounded by blueberry fields, strawberry fields, and daffodil fields. In fact, I spent probably most of my youth out there picking berries or hoeing weeds in these fields. But I have to tell you that when I was 18, I distinctly remember probably like many 18-year-olds, I only wanted to see my hometown in one place, and that was my rearview mirror. I wanted to leave Puyallup. So I went to California. I spent five years there, and I graduated from the University of California at Berkeley. At that time, I decided I would go ahead and fulfill kind of a lifelong dream of mine. I got on a bicycle, and I attempted to bicycle around the world. I kid you not. When I crossed the United States from the East Coast, I went to Greece, and then I ended up in Israel. And to let you know, the very first day I arrived in Israel was October 23rd, 1983. I was woken up very early in the morning by a huge explosion to the north. That night, 250 Marines were killed in the barracks in Beirut. That was the very first night I was in Israel. I ended up living on a kibbutz, and if any of you know what a kibbutz is, uh, they were formed for many people from Europe fleeing in World War II, fleeing oppression. And I actually worked right next to people who had fled Germany during World War II. I saw what they had, in fact, experienced in their own life, the loss of their family members, very dear friends. From there, I traveled. I worked in Greece, and then I bicycled up through Yugoslavia, where I was arrested on suspicion of spying for the United States. And I have to tell you, at that time, I distinctly remember myself thinking, you know, Puyallup is not such a bad place <laughs> after all. The irony to all of this is, is that I bought my parents' household. I live in the very same house. I grew up in the very same neighborhood. I have seen in my experience, I have seen people live and I have seen people die to protect the freedom that they want, the sovereignty of their country, to protect the right to govern themselves. I was chair of the elections committee in the state senate after the Greg Rossi election of 2004. Closest election this state has had in its history. We literally rewrote election law. Everything from the way ballots are counted to moving the primary forward so military personnel, overseas people could participate in elections. In fact, the League of Women Voters online, it's a great report of all the election reform, historic election reform that I authored at that time. But let's not forget, the Secretary of State's office does more than just elections. It handles the state archives. It handles library services. It handles business licenses. And it also deals with foreign trade and a number of other programs. I have been known in Olympia as the foremost advocate of making sure that our government runs efficiently. efficiently. I will make sure that same level of expertise goes to the Office of Secretary of State. In my experience, people want the following from a Secretary of State. They want someone who is fiercely independent. And if any of you know about my background, you know that I am fiercely independent. They want someone who is knowledgeable, and having, in fact, dealt with the election laws that I have, I certainly am knowledgeable, and they want someone who is competent. They want someone who will choose the best policy, not the best political party, to make their decisions by. I believe I'm that person. I look forward to your questions this evening. Thank you. Kim Wyman. Uh, good evening. I'm Kim Wyman, Thurston County Auditor, and we, I came from California, so uh, I am one of those transplants. My husband was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington in 1991, and we have two children that we raised in Lacey, and uh, one now at Gonzaga University and one at Timberline High School in Lacey. And I really believe we would be here about 18 months when we first moved to Washington State. And I have been totally blessed with the most amazing job that turned into a great career in the auditor's office. I started as the assistant recording manager and uh, after about 18 months was promoted to election supervisor. And this is a field uh, like education, like so many other fields, that when you get into it, you either love it or hate it. And if you love it, you'll spend your career there. And I have had wonderful opportunities from not only running elections in Thurston County, 
but uh, going to Russia to observe an election in 1997. And through all of these, the one moment that really stands out and the full circle moment that I have had is when we were stationed in Germany, my husband and I were disenfranchised. It was 1990, and Los Angeles County couldn't get us a ballot in time to vote in an election. And I was in my mid-20s. I had never missed an election, hadn't thought very much about it until you have that right taken away from you. And it changed my view of how important this right that I had uh, really was to me. And I had an opportunity in the auditor's office to affect that. And we did a lot of creative things to make sure our military and overseas voters had the opportunity to cast a ballot. In 1996, for example, we started an email ballot program to increase the number of days that they would have to send us a ballot. And that has come full circle. And in the last legislative session, we uh, helped the legislature sign in a bill that requires a 45-day transit window for all military and overseas ballots. And then the favorite part that I have of that is my daughter is going to be in Spain this fall studying, and she will get to vote for me, hopefully, uh, from Spain by email. So it is it has come full circle, and my experiences in the auditor's office have prepared me to be the next Secretary of State. Um, I have uh, started in the recording section and did the historic preservation of our county's history and then moved to elections in 2000, became the county auditor and have served in that capacity ever since. And I am very excited about the prospect of taking this state forward. We have made great progress since 2004. We have more to do. And this office is very important while down ballot and not as high profile as governor or state senator or US senator. It is one of the most important offices and and I look forward to uh, telling you about what I'm going to bring to that office in the next 20 minutes or so. The first question of the evening goes to Ms. Wyman. And the question is this. A new legislative session will begin days after one of you takes office as the new Secretary of State. What changes will you ask the legislature to make to election law? Well, the first thing that, that I think we need to do is require the state to produce a pamphlet in the primary election. Right now, we produce a statewide printed voter pamphlet in the general election, and then many counties do local voters' pamphlets, but the primary election goes basically untouched for many people who don't have access to the internet. The Secretary of State does an online pamphlet, which is wonderful, but many people still want to have that paper uh, delivered to their house and be able to read it. And we need to do this because the primary election is where many races are decided. In our judicial races, for example, many of those candidates are elected in the primary election, and so voters don't get any information directly from the Secretary of State's office that's neutral and informative, and we need to get that information to them. So that would be one of my highest priorities. And the second one would be that the Secretary of State performs election reviews, where they go into counties and they review their procedures and policies. These need to be done at least every three years. They have lengthened that time out, and I think it is uh, weakening our system, and I think that we need to restore those response by Mr. Castema. Thank you. The first thing I would do if I, in fact, am Secretary of State is to make sure that all the different divisions and the Secretary of State is all headed in the right direction, that we can have a clear vision of where we're going, a clear mission with clear defined outcomes, and the public clearly sees those all of the time. It's important within the first year that a firm foundation be set for that office. I have read the strategic plan of the Secretary of State and there are many commendable parts about it, but there are many disparate parts about it too that I think need far more uniformity. I do not want to pile on more pieces of legislation to the Secretary of State's office. I want that firm foundation. Having said that, any efforts that can step up the ability to register more people in Washington State, I think is necessary and I will look at those. Number two, I will collaborate with Lieutenant Governor and the legislature to better focus on exports and trade. And then finally, I will look at consolidating the archive services of all Washington State for a much more efficient system than we have now. Thank you. Rebuttal by Ms. Wyman. I have nothing in that one. <laughs> Absolutely, that's fine. 
The Secretary of State is responsible for several parts of the initiative process, including verifying the accuracy of signatures. Do you see a need for improvements to any part of that process? And in a broader sense, do you believe the current initiative process is working as our state's founders intended, or is it in need of repair? The initiative process in Washington State was put in place by the public in basically a constitutional amendment in 1912. It was done so to overcome the special interest groups that would be in power in Olympia. At that time, you had liquor companies, you had the timber companies, you had the railroad companies, and this was put into place as a way to overcome those interests. The irony is that, that initiatives today are often used by the very same interest groups who can't get their way in Olympia, they try to bring it to the ballot. I think clarity and transparency is very important. The funders of initiatives, any efforts that we can do to address that. Number two, I sponsored a piece of legislation that said for signature gathers, if you're out there being paid, I think the public needs to know that you're actually being paid if you're a signature gatherer. Finally, I think a modification that needs to be done a bipartisan effort in the legislature this last year looked at if you're going to put an initiative forward and it costs the states money, then you must in fact identify some source of revenue that you can go ahead and use to pay for that as opposed to just kicking it to the legislature and expecting them to fund it. As to the signature verification process, I want to make sure we don't in fact put more costs on the people who are trying to file an initiative to deter them those are offices that, those are duties that the Secretary of State's office should absorb. Response by Ms. Wyman. Our, our founders believe so strongly that the power of governance rested with the people, that our Constitution guarantees your right to, to initiative and referendum, and the Secretary of State's office has to uphold that right. Their role in initiatives is to check the signatures, verify that they meet the constitutional requirements, and are moved to the, the ballot. I believe that our current process works as they intended. It is definitely different than, than how it was written in terms of the money and the focus, and certainly we saw that last year with the, the millions of dollars put into an initiative campaign. But it is imperative that people have that right to sign a petition and to vote on that initiative. And, and at the end of the day, it's still working well because we have many petitions or initiatives that are filed. Very few make it to the ballot and even fewer are actually approved. So it is still working as it was intended and I think it's important and I think that the Secretary of State has to remain neutral and maintain the integrity of that process to ensure that people can have that civic engagement that the founders intended. Any rebuttal by Mr. Costuma? Only say to reiterate the fact that, in fact, we need clarity, transparency to the process. I agree, it, the initiative process has worked as many of the founders, but I've told you about some, in fact, that interest groups have utilized it to their own benefit. And I think the way you deal with that is transparency, clarity to the process. Ms. Wyman, over the past 30 years, Washington State gradually moved from a poll and absentee ballot system to an all-male voting system. Most other states have not followed, but have maintained poll voting. What is your assessment of our experiment in voting entirely by mail? After 30 years, I don't think I'd call it an experiment. And I think that um, we've been very successful in Washington. And as you know, Washington and Oregon really have, uh, are the two states in the country that vote completely by mail. Um, in 2005, by that time, most of our voters were voting by mail anyway. Most counties were up to 60% of their registered voters were absentee voters. And in many elections, we were seeing anywhere from 80 to 90% of the votes cast by mail in poll site elections. And it really was time to move over. Um, we are leading the nation in this, and, and Washington State in particular, I think, has made a very secure process. I think our, our citizens have confidence in, in the vote by mail process, and I think it's serving us well. There's always more that we can do to improve it, and I think we need to do that. It needs to be transparent, it needs to be accurate, and it needs to be something people believe when the results are revealed that that's the way that people voted. Um, I can tell you though, many states are considering moving to it, especially in the West Coast states, because they are finding that poll sites are very expensive and hard to manage. And we are seeing states like Colorado and California that I think you are gonna see move to vote by mail as Washington has. 
Mr. Castema. Thank you. Uh, prior to 2005, again, you had, in essence, two different elections taking place at the polls and then also by mail. I actually drafted the piece of legislation that allowed Washington State to go to an all mail in state for voting. But let me tell you a condition that I made in that piece of legislation. It would not have passed if, in fact, it was not left up to the discretion of the local counties. And that's how, in fact, we passed it. That's how we had the votes to do that. The only thing I would say is, well, actually, all the counties in Washington State went that direction other than one, and that was Pierce County. Uh, this last legislative session, there was a bill, that the, the one prior to this one, and by the way, we've had so many special sessions, you're going to have to help me with the numbers here. But last year, during session, there was a bill that mandated that everyone go to, in fact, mail-in ballots. I opposed that bill because, again, I believe that it should have been a local decision. Now that, in fact, it has gone that way, though, when you, in fact, go back, if you ever go back to a poll voting system, the expense, getting equipment, setting up an alternative system, is really cost prohibitive. Um, the uh, final thing I would say, a study in King County that was recently released showed, I think, kind of uh, some sad results. It showed that, in fact, voter turnout rate had not really increased considerably or had not increased under a vote-by-mail system. Um, but one thing that did come out of that was far more clarity as what, to what happened to the ballots, far more security. So that was one benefit. But the voter turnout never, in fact, occurred. Any rebuttal, Ms. Wyman? Just that, also giving the context of moving to vote by mail, that when we were doing poll site elections, it was really effectively running two elections, and many of the problems that occurred in 2004 happened in the polling places. We all remember them very fondly, and I miss them, but at the end of the day, vote by mail has actually improved the consistency among counties, which was one of the problems in the 2004 election, and has made our system, I think, stronger and better. Here's a question for Mr. Castema. Some people are speculating about online voting. What kind of voting system would you like to see in Washington 10 years from now, and what steps will you take to make that a reality? I think what's ever important when you deal with new technology and integrating that into elections is to make sure that, in fact, you have some sort of a way to audit or to verify what actually did happen. When I was chair of the committee in 2005, what at that time, Snohomish County and Yakima County, they actually used electronic voting. But there was no auditing trail that would get, allow you to know, in fact, if the machines were tabulating correctly. We were one of the first states in the nation to put forward legislation that required a paper trail for all electronic voting. Now, of course, um, it's not an issue because we don't have these electronic tabulating machines. And we're currently experimenting with online voting with military personnel. And I think there's actually opportunities to do it with people who are um, uh, military people, people with disabilities, et cetera. As to what it will look like in the future, though, I'm not sure what technology will be there in 10 years, to be very honest with you. But whatever it is, I want to make sure you can audit it you can verify it so that, in fact, it's not just left up to some electronic device where someone may, in fact, compromise the integrity of it. Well, first of all, as an election official, I can tell you that n there isn't an election official in the state that would have a system that wasn't 100% secure and accurate in its tabulation. And online or, or even any kind of electronic voting really is going to be a challenge, and, and it's, it's difficult to look and see what it's going to be like in 10 years. The first reason is the Internet isn't secure. It wasn't built secure, and the source code for writing apps and, and Internet applications to do Internet voting, for example, are open source. And in a, an election software, you're going to want something that's secure. So that's problematic just on a foundation level. Um, people are accustomed to online banking. They can go in and, and work on M ATMs or do things from home. The problem is, is that banking is reversible. If your bank makes a mistake or charges something to your credit card, they can reverse it. An election, your ballot has to be secure. 
it has to be encrypted so no one can tamper with it. And once you cast that ballot, there's no way to undo it. So if it is hacked, if it is, if something happens to that, there's no way to undo that damage. And our votes are too precious. So it's going to be difficult and a challenge because with the lit litigious uh, society that we've become in elections, many vendors are not investing in new technology because quite frankly, it's too costly for them. So we in the elections community are uh, really concerned about the future of voting and there isn't a clear uh, choice. Any reply, Mr. Kastamar? No, that's Let's fine. Let's move on then and we'll move on to the last question in this series of questions so far and then we'll go to audience questions after this. And this question goes to Ms. Wyman. Many Washington voters retain a negative impression of election integrity in the state because of the controversial gubernatorial race in 2004 to which both of you have alluded. Give your views on what went wrong in that election and then whether you believe that the problems have been addressed and indeed solved. Well, remember, that was the closest governor's race in our nation's history. 2.7 million ballots cast, and it was separated by 133 votes. Um, I think the biggest challenge that uh, affected that election was the fact that at that time we had 39 separate voter registration databases. Each county had their own separate list, and that's where you saw the duplicate voters that were registered and the felons that were on the list and the deceased people, we just pay couldn't keep up with the paper going from county to county. Um, one of the big improvements since that time is we now have a, a statewide voter registration database, a single list. We've reduced, we don't have any duplicate registrations. We've cleaned up the felons. We've made a change in the law where now there's a very clear line in the sand of whether or not you are eligible to vote if you have committed a felony and it's whether you're under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. And um, the other big change was we are now a vote by mail state. And so now election officials are running a single election on election night rather than having uh, polling places where the average age of a worker is 67 years old. They're asked to work a 16 hour day, be accurate, not make any mistakes whatsoever. Oh, and by the way, not take a break or a lunch. Um, we were really setting them up to fail and, uh, and now it's more secure. Mr. Kastamer. The problem with the 2004 election, frankly, was complacency. It wasn't fraud, it was complacency. At that time, we cut the audits that Kim had mentioned where the state auditor goes out and state uh, Secretary of State audits the local auditors. We cut those out of the budget. We ignored complaints that had been going on for years of the treatment of provisional ballots in Washington State. We took elections for granted, frankly, and that's what actually happened in 2004. There were about 1,678 illegal votes in that particular election. And again, it ended up being that we had about 130 vote difference. We had duplicate voters. We had ineligible felons. We had diseased, deceased persons. Which did, what did happen that it did help that is the unified database. But here's the problem with all of the issues relating to that election, is that same level of complacency can take, can happen again. That's why it's very important, and that's why, frankly, I'm running for this election, is I think you need a person who is on the outside of the election system, just like what we did in 2005 and 2006. The auditors, Secretary of State's office, wasn't the one that had to look from the outside to transform the system. It took the legislature. The judge in that decision clearly said the executive and the legislature have to intervene to rectify the current election environment that existed then. That's why, to make sure this doesn't happen again, you need someone in there from an outside perspective actually looking at the elections and making sure they will work. Any rebuttal, Ms. Wyman? I wouldn't say complacent. I think that the biggest problem going into 2004 is the auditors had worked so hard for so many years with the legislature to add more convenience, more variables, more opportunities for people to um, vote up, you know, up to 15 days before, or register to vote 15 days before the election, that we didn't have enough time to do the things to prepare properly. And that was part of what set up some of the uh, mistakes that were made uh, during the election. And, and the auditors, I think, are very vigilant in making sure that the elections are well done. We have time for one of our other prepared questions because we have two audience questions so far. So that gives me an opportunity to ask uh, another question. And it is this, and this is Mr. Kastama's question initially. Secretary of State Sam Reed has said that it is impossible, that is impossible, under current law 
to identify non-citizens on the voting list. If elected, would you take any actions to ensure that only citizens are listed as active voters? And if so, what action would you take? First of all, if you vote in Washington State and you're a non-citizen, it's a felony. Under the Bush administration, the Department of Justice looked to see if they could find fraud that was taking place out there, people who were registered who, in fact, were non-citizens. Under President Bush, they could not find any. In the 2004 election, there were many attempts. Many people were scouring the voting rolls looking for people who were non-citizens, and they couldn't find them. I think the people of Washington State need to be treated rationally. Fears have got to be based, based on reason. Why is it that we don't find people who are non-citizens, actually registered voters? Think of it. A person who is a non-citizen does not want to put their name on a list that's public, doesn't want people like myself, politicians, elected people, coming to their door and highlighting their presence. If anything, they do not want that. Now, what we did do in election reform in 2005, we made it so that, in fact, if a list does come to exist of who is a citizen and who is not, that it can be used by the Secretary of State to check everyone who registers to vote. Sam Reed is right. There's people in the United States, I think, would have a very difficult time understanding. There is no definitive list out there on whether, in fact, you are a citizen or not. But let me tell you, if you put restrictions, such as showing birth certificate or a passport to register to vote, number one, you will be sued, and it will probably be uh, overturned in federal court, the year implementation of that, and also you will shut down voter registration in Washington State to the point where you will not have as many people, and we will not be as competitive as we should, do, should be with the number of people out there voting. Ms. Wyman? Election administrators around the state know that there is no list of U.S. citizens available for us to compare our voter registration list to. So we don't have a way to verify the 3.6 million voters that are on the rolls in Washington state to this list. And that's the biggest challenge that we face. The role of the Secretary of State is to ensure that you have confidence that that list is legitimate, and um, we have to balance access and security. Those are always competing interests, and I think our state does a good job of that right now. In terms specifically of the uh, citizenship issue, the natural place, if you want to start creating a list, the natural place to do that is the Department of Licensing. And this is a policy level decision that the legislature needs to make, because it to have all 3.6 million people come in and show us some sort of proof of, it, of citizenship is not going to be a workable solution. You could begin to um, require uh, either proof of citizenship or legal presence, which would build the list over time. Um, this would be a way, but you've got to have the legislative will to do that, and, um, and I think that that would build it over time. Mr. Castamer? I would agree with the remedy that it should come from the Department of Licensing. I think there are a few options out there that other states have utilized, dual driver's license, for example, one that you can go ahead and use to drive an automobile, the other one you can drive an automobile, plus it functions as a form of identification. I think that we will have to deal with this issue in the future. The Real ID Act is something else, too, on a federal level that is requiring that we have more and more a verifiable piece of identification. So I think that's something we're going to have to deal with in the future, and that is a good suggestion with the Department of Licensing. I agree. All right, Mr. Castema, this next question comes from our audience, and it does involve voter identification. And in fact, most of the questions do, because this is an important question to the voters in Washington State. Identification for driver's licenses in Washington State is more lax than in nearly any other state. Do you agree that some proof of citizenship or valid U.S. residency should be required to vote? I believe what would you do, to, because you have addressed this, so let okay. me just add something, an yes. addendum here. What would you do to bring pressure to bear on the Department of Licensing to get that going? I think I explained that good remedy would be what a number of other states have done, or at least I know of a couple who have, that have done this, where they have a differentiation in a driver's license, one that in fact can be used for identification, the other one can be used for identification and, or excuse me, uh, for driving, and excuse me, one for driving and one for um, identification and driving. In other words, you do have something that is verifiable that doesn't in fact require a birth certificate or a passport. Um, 
I think that is the remedy. I would agree the Secretary of State's office is not the one that would require that before you actually register to vote. HAVA, the Help America Vote Act, allows people to go ahead and to register to vote if they can provide the last four digits of their social security number or some way to identify themselves. It does not require that in fact they give the full social security number and that you have to prove that you are a U.S. citizen. In Arizona right now, they had a law that did that for voters and right now it is being stopped in the federal courts. So I think that uh, the remedy is a solution that I mentioned. There. That is, in fact, in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, so we'll find out whether or not that actually works. Right. Um, Kim Wyman, what is your response to the question about voter identification and getting at least a driver's license that means something in the state of Washington, and um, do you have any remedies to that? Well, I, I think one of the pieces to it, as I mentioned before, you have to balance the access and the security. And one of the challenges, and, and we're seeing it in other states as it, this is being litigated, is um, the challenges is that many lower income people may, that may be a, become a barrier to voting because they can't afford to get a driver's license. So a piece of that has to be providing for some sort of access so you aren't disenfranchising people because they can't afford a driver's license. On the, the other side of that though, I think it's very reasonable in our society to be asked for your driver's license for, or some form of identification for things from going to Costco to, you know, and of course I'm blanking on another good example, but but it is a very common thing that, that our people are asked to do. So I think there is a reasonableness that many people believe to ask for a driver's license or identification to register to vote and proof of citizenship being a part of that. So. Um, you know, I, b I believe that uh, we need to strike a balance and it, it is something that I think the legislature needs to address and needs to talk through. Any rebuttal? Only that I understand the concern because we use a driver's license in airports for security and it identifies people. And in fact, the Real ID Act was an act put in place to try and come up with a verifiable piece of documentation and it dealt with terrorism. That's why it was passed in Congress. So I, I think that um, there's a valid concern. I do agree that the legislature has been negligent in not dealing with this issue. In fact, there was a time, and, and I wish it would have come up for a vote. It would, did not come up for a vote. Um, there was a time when we had more people with a license in Washington State than we had potential drivers in our state. And that is incorrect. It should have been solved by the legislature. Here's another audience question, and Mr. Castama, this goes to you first. Are either, or are you a member of a union? Which one, if you are? And this is something that someone would like to know. I am not a member of a union, no. Okay, Kim Wyman. Uh, no, I am not a member of a union. I was at one time, and when I first was with the auditor's office, I was with the uh, AFSCME 618. It is time now to move on to our yes or no questions that have been prepared. And the following uh, policies were proposed in the 2012 legislative session. Please indicate your views on each one by showing a yes card if you would support the legislation or a no card if you would oppose it. Do you each have your cards? We do. Excellent. And we were here, we'll be here ready and waiting to see what you have to say. Would you automatically register to vote anyone who obtained a driver's license unless they opted out. Allow new registrations to vote up to and on election day. Allow 16 and 17 year olds to register to vote. Victoria, I just wanna say on that, it's to register. It is not to actually vote, but to register, and yes. Require proof of citizenship for voter registration. A Voting Rights Act that would allow lawsuits over district lines and other election processes that are purportedly unfair to minority voters. We now have time, unless the timekeeper tells me otherwise, we now have time to begin our three-minute closing statements for each of the individuals here in front of us. I want to say before you do your closing statements, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you to the Freedom Foundation for making this happen, as well as Coov.com. It has been a pleasure to spend this time with you, and it has flown by much too quickly. Uh, Kim Wyman, your closing argument, if you will, for the voters of Washington. Uh, once again, thank you for putting on this forum this evening. I think it's so important to uh, expose people to what this office is about. Um, 
Experience really matters in this office. I can't stress that enough. The Secretary of State's office oversees not only elections, but the corporation filings for the nonprofit and, and for-profit businesses in our state, as well as the state's history in archives and the state library. And this experience is unique. It is what I've been doing at the county level for the last 22 years, and um, it translates, and I will bring that experience to the Secretary of State's office. In many of my, in my opponents, uh, my opponents have mentioned that they have either been on the ballot and ran as a candidate or they've worked on campaigns. And while that is true, it's not the same as administering an election. And this is a very specific skill set that you have to develop over a period of time. I've conducted 84 elections over the last 20 years and that experience has me prepared to make good policies, to help the legislature write good laws that will make our elections secure and have the integri integrity that we need that if we have another repeat election in the governor's race, heaven forbid, that is separated by 133 votes, that after the ballots are counted and it's certified, that people believe that those results are reflect how people voted and that it was accurate and that it was secure. And that's what I will bring to the Secretary's, Secretary of State's office. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Mr. Kastema. Sam Reed, one of the hallmarks of his career was standing up to the party after the 2004 election when people wanted to revote. He in fact insisted that we continue with the process of going through the courts and uphold the election results that took place. Those of you who know me know that again, I'm a very fiercely independent person. Just recently I crossed the party lines and I voted for a budget of a coalition of Republicans and Democrats. I did that because for years I worked on government reform, I worked on restructuring government, and I saw those efforts after three months of working come to the point where they weren't going to happen. And I came to the conclusion, I came to the conclusion that the best reform you can do is by governing. You need someone who's a Secretary of State who actually has demonstrated that they are fiercely independent. Sam Reed did that, I have done that. I believe you need to treat the people in Washington State as if they're completely rational. If I show them that I have a clear vision, clear mission, clear values, objectives, and goals for the Secretary of State's office, that you'll see that I am doing a good job and you will have faith in our election system. Let me tell you what will happen if I'm Secretary of State. When you walk into my office, on the wall will be a balanced scorecard for every single division in the Secretary of State's office. You'll be able to see very clearly what the vision, mission of that particular division is. You're going to see very clearly what the objectives with goals, and then you're going to see whether or not we're achieving those goals, both good or bad. Because I think the people of Washington State need, in fact, agencies that are managed well. They need a Secretary of State's office that can demonstrate to them that it's performing well. Then we, in fact, are not somewhere in the middle when it comes to voter registration and voter turnout, but in fact, we're towards the top. And right now, we're still towards the middle on both of those factors. We have a lot to improve on. That's what I think people need in Washington State, independence, and I do have the knowledge, in fact, necessary for this position. Thank you very much for being here this evening. I want to thank Kim Wyman for this opportunity to debate her, and I look for more opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. My honor. Am I muted? Is that on? Still? Okay. Well, thank you very much. There was one person in the audience that I wanted to recognize, the Clark County Assessor, Peter Norwick. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for attending. I'd like to thank again uh, the Couve.com for covering this event with the video and partnering with us. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming. I'd like to thank you all again. It's, it is our mission and we believe that our government works when our citizens and the electorate are educated and active and engaged in the process. And I'd like to make a special thanks to the candidates that uh, participated tonight, to uh, Otter Kim Wyman and to uh, Senator Jim Kasma. And it's the diversity of candidates and quality candidates that also uh, make our system work. 
as well as it does today. So thank you for putting yourself out in this way, and thank you for participating in this debate. If you all like what you have seen tonight, the Freedom Foundation uh, is funded largely by individual donors just like you. Um, we won't make a hard pitch and put the handcuffs on you, but uh, we do have envelopes. If you'd like to make a donation or join the Freedom Foundation, you can do that. I know there's a lot of members of the Freedom Foundation here tonight. If you're already a member, take a couple envelopes and give them to your friends and let them know about uh, what we do, if indeed you like what we do. And with that, I'd like to close out the evening. Thank you very much for coming.